Booker Prize 2021. How did we end up here? Each year, five judges are selected to judge the Booker Prize. They read... 117. 178. I think it's worth dwelling on that for a moment. The judges were only announced on the 15th of December and the long list on the 27th of July. That's 224 days to read 158 books. If you do some simple maths, that's the equivalent rate of 257 books a year. That's significantly quicker than most booktubers read at. I'm floored. Promise there'll only be four or five more jokes that bad in the entire video. 158 books, the judges have picked 13. The best 8%, but soon 13 will become 6 and then 1. Which one of these books are worth reading? Which ones will make the shortlist? And who is this year's Shuggy Bane? In order to cut our 13 books down, I'm going to start with the worst books. So you'll have to wait till later in the video for me to answer those questions. You could just skip ahead to later in the video, but please don't do that. It'll mess up my stats and nobody will subscribe. Subscribe. The Sweetness of water. It's not that this book is bad, but it is the worst of the 13. And the next book is bad. It takes away my will to do anything. Stand up, to breathe, to live, to continue reviewing this. <sighs> second place, or second last place. Dear Jeffers, since our last communication, I've become rather obsessed with Mabel's book, Lorenzo and House. I've even written about it. Jeffers, you may say that it's only got seven reviews on Goodreads and that I don't even know Mabel, so it's presumptuous to use her first name. But you've been dead for 60 years and the book judges will be drawn to this sort of masturbatory rhythm like flies to shit. I'm currently staying with this couple who make booktube videos. I do wish they'd review my book, Jeffers, but they keep saying things like no plot, no theme, and with a dialogue that takes the feminist discussion back 90 years. I keep telling them, Jeffers, that's the point, but they keep talking about this other book, Daryl, by this author, Jackie S. And I just want to say, Jeffers, what about me? I want to scream it. Does my book not have great setting? Does it not have exquisite writing? It does, if you're into that sort of thing. Jeffers, Jeffers, did you hear that? Maybe they like it. Validation, Jeffers. Jeffers, are you there? Jeffers, Jeffers, Robinson, stop ignoring me. Oh, I'm writing this. And you're 60 years dead. I'm so lonely, Jeffers. I'm so lonely, Jeffers. Am I even here? I do wish somebody would pay attention to me. It's probably the weird hair. A Passage North. A novel about grief, love, loss, and family set in the backdrop of the Sri Lankan Civil War. How could this book not be amazing? It includes 250 pages of... <sighs> China Room. This book is like a party popper when what you want is a kinder surprise. Mihar is mixing chilli into one brother's meal, ginger into another, and garlic into the last, in the hopes that when her husband comes to bed in the evening, she'll be able to tell which brother she's married to. What a powerful opening scene. How much does that tell us about Mihar? What a bang with streamers. Now you have an empty party popper with no chocolate and no toy. The choice to take away the voices of the women in this novel is exactly the sort of self-aware style over substance rubbish that people avoid book and nomination books for. Is Sohoto giving us a novel about Stockholm Syndrome or is he completely out of touch with women? We've cut the short list down from 13 to 9 and now it's time to look at the standout novels, the ones that are definitely going to be on the short list, the ones that could even win. And there's one book that really does stand out to me. Booker fans will hate this. No one is talking about this. Take a talented poet and ask her to write funny tweets and turn it into a novel. Sounds like a disaster. Doesn't it? Except Lockwood is almost writing poetry. After each line, you can stop, discuss it and analyse it or just laugh. Lockwood is stretching what the definition of a novel is. It's the sort of thing which some readers will really hate, but writers love. It's the sort of novel which expands an art form. Expands an art form. And you called Rachel Cuss's novel masturbatory. I've seen this novel being called of the moment and transitory, but social media might have suddenly appeared overnight. Most of us can remember a pre-Facebook or Twitter time, uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to die just as quick. Your grandchildren will still be using Snapgrinder and Tweetspace before buying organic chickens on Tinder. But to focus on the issue of internet culture and not what Lockwood is saying about reproductive rights, motherhood, loss and grief and a sense of oneself is really selling the book short. The issues here are timeless. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's my cynical view of the world, but the only way reproductive rights is not going to be a timeless issue is if some megacorp makes billions of dollars off it. And grief and being a parent are themes which many other books on the long list also discuss. But no other book asks you if it's still PC to talk about the braille of her nipples. What does yours say? Lockwood's novel probably won't win the Brooker Prize. In fact, it's probably unlikely to be shortlisted, but it's the only one of these books that we'd be talking about in a decade's time. And I don't care if the judges disagree with me. I'm putting it on my shortlist. The Promise. 
from no one is talking about this to everyone is talking about this. How does a white man talk about racism with insight? Well, they do it from the perspective of a white man. Set in South Africa during and after apartheid, Gal Gadot educates us on a few issues. Like, did you know it was illegal for black people to own property during apartheid? If you ask most people if they're racist, they'll say they aren't. Yet we live in a society that disadvantages people based on race. And Gal Gadot is able to demonstrate how this happens. A black woman named Solami is promised a house by her dying white boss. But due to the action of her boss's husband and children, she's unable to receive the house. Nobody considers their actions racist. They consider themselves serving it worst. Um, yet they prevent Salome from having a house which is rightfully hers. Gilgot is able to capture the changing views, not just of South Africa over a period of almost 50 years, but also of his characters as they age and their motivations change their views. One of the things I really love about this novel is that a lot of the injustices Salome faced are about class or sexism. But that isn't divorced from racism. It's also powerful that while this book is about Salami, she hardly appears in it because racism is not a black person's problem. It's a white person's problem. Golgot has written a book about race aimed at white people, and he's done a fantastic job. And this is another book that makes the short list. Actually, I'm going to predict it here. This is probably going to be our sugi this year. The Fortune Men. A historical fiction based on real life events set in 1950s Cardiff and following a Somali immigrant who is wrongfully accused of murder. I won't tell you a lie, but this novel is a bit yachafi, and I'm a bit like, oh, oh, Nadifa, where to you going with this? I don't mean to be chopsy, but I've had to restart the novel three times. Another time, and I'll be mitching it. But by the time I come to an end, it was well tidy. A really powerful novel about belonging and acceptance, or rather about not belonging or not being accepted. Um, not the most accessible. But a very good novel, and there is fantastic payoff if you persevere with the initial slog. So, does the Fortune Man make the the short list? I'll add it now in a minute. Now that the best and the worst books are removed, we've got six left and three spaces. Let's review the last six books and figure out where we're going to end up. An Island. I was delighted to see a book on the short list that not only I had never heard of, but that most people had never heard of.、Um, I jumped online and purchased a copy as soon as I could find one. This was the only book I purchased a physical copy of.、Uh, and if you're in Australia, you probably know that this was a special combination of unfortunate and just fucking stupid. But for everybody else, Australia Post, eat a dick.、Um, I haven't read this book because I still don't have it. Light perpetual. Five children die in an air raid during World War II, but what if they didn't die? What would their lives look like? That's the premise of Light Perpetual, and let's get this out of the way early. The premise is utter garbage. It actively makes the book worse. So too does the heavy-handed ending. So why didn't I put this book with the bad ones? Well. The rest of the book is actually quite masterful. These five children's lives manage to create a picture of what London was like and how it changed over seventy years. There's one absolutely harrowing scene in this, and the dread, fear, disgust, hatred, and sadness I felt during it was intense. And it was followed up later in the novel with a completely different scene that produced a very similar feeling. And you're left wondering which is worse. And I think it's a very talented author who can match two scenes with that same intense. Feeling. The book is both very easy to criticise and very easy to praise, and just like those two scenes, which produced intense emotions, were well balanced, so too are the qualities and the flaws of this book. It's hard to tell if it's a good or a bad novel. Great Circle. 600 pages is not the thousand-page bulky novel that this book was initially planned to be. Nonetheless, you do wonder if it's carrying a bit of excess weight. Don't mind that. That's just a chair. It's essential to the storyline. Hedley Baxter is a Hollywood starlet who has recently left the movie franchise Archangel in scandal. The role of Marion Graves, famous aviator, beckons. Marion went missing on the last leg of a flight, trying to circumnavigate the world north, north to south, and is the cornerstone of the novel. Her twin Jamie really steals the show. Jamie is a good man who has his beliefs. He's a pacifist. He doesn't eat meat. He's tested on this repeatedly, and especially in the light of World War Two and Pearl Harbor. Will he join the war or will he be a pacifist? I love the questions that Jamie is forced to answer. He's a character we don't see a lot of in literature today. He's a positive male role model who's not perfect, but he's not important to the plot. So, can I put it down? Put the chair down before you break the camera. <laughs> really, quite out of breath after doing that. That's really hard. <laughs> it's a bit.
bit of a shoulder workout. Marion and Henley's lives are linked in this novel, and it's a great device for Shipstead to explore feminism and how the role of women have changed or not changed over the 90 years separating these two timelines. There are countless other themes, such as the two-spirit sexuality, prostitution, family obligations, and how bisexuals fit into gay society. It really is an entertaining novel if it is just carrying slightly too much. A town called Solace. Set in 1972 in the far north Canadian town of, you guessed it, Solace. This novel follows three protagonists. Clara is eight. Her sister Rose has run away from home. She's 16. Her elderly neighbour Elizabeth has entrusted her to mind her house and her cat while she goes to hospital. But then a strange man named Leon moves in. What Clara doesn't know is that Elizabeth is terminally ill and is not coming home, and Liam is her next of kin. Liam has been recently divorced, and when he surprisingly inherits a home from Elizabeth, a lady who used to care for him when he was a child, but he'd not had much to do with for 30 years. While Elizabeth is dead, but that doesn't stop Mary Lawson from using her as a narrator. Elizabeth's final days are spent reflecting on her own life, and Lawson uses Elizabeth's narrative to fill in the gaps of our knowledge. This is a book on the long list for people who avoid booker books. I've heard a lot of people criticise it and say it's flat and that there's no depth, and that was my initial thoughts too. But this book has really stayed with me after reading it. It places equal value on plot, character and ideas. It's easy to digest and understand, and none of that means that it's a bad book. In fact, it's quite thought-provoking and emotionally complex. Themes of parenthood and belonging are things that we can all relate to, although I'm not sure what to make of all the rock-hard ice cream in the frozen north of Canada. It's cold outside. Uh, that shit ain't gonna defrost. Eat a fucking pie. Are Canadians really that weird? Do you all eat ice cream in the winter? Clara and the sun. From one Clara to the next, and in this literary light sci-fi novel, we have themes of parenthood again, but also questions around life, religion, spirituality, memory, learning, and exactly what is humanity. It's quite an ambitious list of topics Ishiguro has given himself. And this is a strangely divisive book because it's actually quite a pleasant novel, but people seem to either love this book or they find it a bit meh, whatever. Ishiguro may have been trying to get readers to ask questions about the meaning of life, but this book asks a completely different question. Why do we like different books? Nobody is saying anything other than this is a competent, well-executed novel, but Nobel Laureate, Booker Prize-winning novelist Kashir Ishiguro comes with expectations. And if you can put those expectations aside, then this is a good book. If you're expecting greatness, then you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Let's bring Bewilderment by Richard Powers into this discussion. Both authors' use of light sci-fi is really interesting. Actually, there's quite a bit in common between Clara and Bewilderment. Themes of parenthood and questions about humanity and critiques of society run through both. There's so much crossover that one feels that only one of these two books can progress to the shortlist. They're too similar. Bewilderment. Astrobiologist Theo has recently lost his wife, Ali, leaving him to care for his young son, Robin, or Robbie. Robbie is getting into trouble at school. He's an intelligent child who is struggling to fit in. He has a swath of different diagnoses, from ADHD to autism. He's not your normal child, whatever that may mean. And Theo is clearly grieving the loss of his wife, but no measure is given to Robbie, who might be grieving the loss of his mum. As the state's child protective services pressure Theo into medicating Robbie for a condition he may or may not have, an experimental solution is found. A new system that maps brainwaves will help Robbie train his brain through a series of exercises. There's so much in this novel. Activism, the internet, bureaucracy, government, parenthood, grief, loss, the Fermi paradox. Are humans going to run ourselves into extinction? Scientific funding, scientific ethics, and bird watching. Yet none of these topics feel rushed or unexplored. And that's why, even though Clara is a better sci-fi novel, Bewilderment is the better novel. And that's why Bewilderment is on the shortlist. That leaves us with two spots and four books, and I think Great Circle has to take one. It's a well-crafted novel, and I've never heard a book missing out on the shortlist for being a bit too chunky. For all the good things I can say about Light Perpetual, you can't really get away with having a bad premise, so that misses out. Um, although, looking at who the judges are this year, then Light Perpetual might get some favourable treatment. 
That leaves me with A Town Called Solace as the last book in the shortlist. But that's conditional, because I haven't yet read An Island, and if that turns out to be a good book, it's going to take the sixth spot, and A Town Called Solace will miss out. I think this is a shortlist where every novel offers something different. Every book could walk away with the prize, although it's hard to see the promise not collecting the top honours, if I'm completely honest. If you'd like an actual analysis or review of these 13 books, please hit subscribe and ring that bell. There's quite a few coming there, just in the editing pipeline. Bye. Thank you.